Good evening, everyone. Thank you for attending uh, tonight's meeting. Could you please join me in saluting the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, with liberty and justice for all. If you could just join me for a moment. Um, the Brockton community, unfortunately, uh, has recently lost a number of wonderful people. Um, the first person I'd like to mention and just have a moment of silence for is um, Sergeant Tracy Harrington. Um, she, uh, we've lost her far too uh, soon. Uh, I'd like to send my sympathies to both uh, her husband, Chris, and also to uh, Mayor Harrington and his uh, family. Um, so just a moment of silence for the Harringtons and uh, Tracy. Thank you. Um, Superintendent? Yes, uh, while we remain standing. Uh, also, um, we had uh, notified of the loss of Principal Carlton Campbell's mom uh, just this past weekend. Um, again, a very large family. A number of them work in our district. There were certainly students in our district. So our sympathies go out to the Campbell family. And also a former administrative assistant, uh, June Tebow, who worked at the Davis School for many years as uh, the administrative assistant there. So. Uh, Again, our, our sympathies and a moment of silence, please. I'm sorry, while you're standing, uh, Deputy Superintendent Thomas informed me. Uh, I knew that uh, Principal Campbell's mom had, had been ill, um, and unfortunately, uh, we also were just notified that she has also passed away, so the Davis community, again, uh, our sympathies to Darlene, her family, uh, her daughter, who is one of our school uh, adjustment counselors in the district, uh, and the entire uh, Campbell family. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, we start our meeting off first with the hearing of visitors. I do not believe that anyone has signed in this evening. So the um, next item, therefore, on our agenda is the consent agenda. The consent agenda is the bundling of a number of routine uh, matters uh, for a um, approval from the school committee. Uh, this is an opportunity if any of the members would like to remove any particular item to speak in a little more detail. Now would be your opportunity to uh, say so. Anyone want to remove any of the items? Um, no? Okay. Um, I'm just going to make a... Um, uh, I'd like to remove item D. Um, so could um, someone make a motion then to approve items A, B, C, E, and F? Oh, Mr. I didn't see that. Oh, okay. Well, then I'll defer to you. I'll defer to you. So Mr. Gormley will remove item D. So could we have a vote on items A, B, C, E, and F? Consent agenda items A, B, C, E, and F. A second. Thank you, Mr. D'Agostino. Any further discussion on those items? All in favor? Okay. Mr. Gormley, item D. Yes, well, we'd like to recognize the lacrosse program for receiving the Bill Belichick Foundation uh, lacrosse grant for $10,000. I know head coach uh, Seamus Clifford is here to uh, accept the grant tonight. Um, I don't know if we have a big fake check to give him. I don't see one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's a large check, <laughs> but um, um, I think that this is, uh, you know, obviously a very generous um, uh, donation from the Bill Belichick Foundation. Um, uh, 
I'd like to certainly thank um, our grants officer, uh, Karen Watkins Watts, uh, Kevin Cairo, uh, certainly Coach Clifford. Um, I know firsthand from a number of uh, students, um, including my son, who um, speak so highly of Coach Clifford and um, just really enjoy uh, playing uh, under his supervision. He's done a great job with the kids and uh, it just seems that that program is expanding and expanding and uh, the students really enjoy it. Um, I uh, was with a few of the kids this weekend and they were already mentioning lacrosse, ready for, I think it's so cold that they're all ready for spring lacrosse, <laughs> but uh, they're looking forward to it. So um, this is obviously wonderful and um, I just want to say a shout out to Coach Clifford. You're doing a wonderful job and the kids really um, enjoy uh, what you do with them. So thank you. Um, anything else, um, Mr. Gormley, on that? No, you touched on it. Big thank you to everybody involved. Hmm. Great thing that we've got going there. Okay. Um, anyone else on that item? No? Mr. Gormley, could you make a motion to approve? I'd like to make a motion to approve item D, the acceptance of the Bill Belichick Foundation grant for the lacrosse program. Thank you, Mr. D'Agostino. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Wonderful. Okay, um, next item, communication. Uh, no communication. What? I did not receive any communication since I last met with you on the 2nd of January to share with the public. Okay. All right. Report of Superintendent of Schools. That I have lots of information, no Mr. Minicello. I have lot, unfortunately for all of you, I have lots of information. Um, as usual, uh, I want to start with our student representative who continues to be a very active uh, member of our school committee, uh, Ms. Sharma Arais, a senior at Brockton High School and an upcoming graduate of 2018. Good evening. Hello, everyone. I hope you guys enjoyed the start to the year. And I know it's been pretty productive for us at Brockton High. So the boys um, basketball team won on Friday against Derby and are now um, and are now playing a game. And it's two to zero in the big three, which is eight to zero overall. Uh, the boys basketball um, <laughs> team is playing Brighton tonight um, as well and wrestling is going to happen tomorrow night at not at seven sorry against Durfee as well um, and throughout the week um, National History Day an annual thing that we have at Brockton High and some of the middle schools happen for juniors mainly and National History Day is where students in a history class make a board about a person or an event or a thing in history that they find interesting and they want to do more research about. And it's worked on from like the beginning of the year to this like deadline. Um, so I, I wasn't able to walk around, but I heard that the posters were great. They were really tall and creative. I know my friend, she put like lights all over them and because it had to do with the planets or something like that, but it looked pretty good. <laughs> and um, there was also bilingual testing this week, so that, um, that happened. And I just wanted to present the ugly Christmas sweater, like a few pictures of that, because it seemed like you guys would enjoy that. And they look pretty good, so. <laughs> so if you remember at the last meeting, we asked Shama, which he mentioned that during the holidays, they had celebrated the ugly Christmas sweater contest. So I had asked her if she would share with us. <laughs> These are just a student on Those the left nice. and then some <laughs> teachers on the right. They, they were pretty decked out too. more teachers and seniors oh, yeah, really showed their pride. One of the students looked like he has ugly pants on too. Yep, <laughs> they went all out. 
Yeah, there was a whole suit. It looked like wrapping paper. It was great. Funny. Yep. <laughs> Some individual ones. And a, a llama. I, I love that. <laughs> And that was the one with what looks like a pug, and you can't really see it, but it lights up and it makes music. And they won the ugliest sweaters <laughs> by Miss Foley, the one in the middle. Some unicorns. <laughs> Some more seniors. And that was all. <laughs> it was a pretty fun day. Were you in there? No, I, I, I was kind of behind the pictures. <laughs> you, I'm sorry? I was behind the pictures more than I was Taking in the, the pictures. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was all. Thank you. <laughs> yep. Shama, I have to tell you, I did have an opportunity. I ran in at the last minute of the uh, History Day uh, presentation last mm -hmm. week. Um, it's always amazing. It, it isn't just the presentation of the boards or now the uh, web-based, uh, the videos. I mean, so yeah. much goes into putting together uh, National History Day. Mm -hmm. But the students' presentation and being able to explain and the excitement about researching something of interest to them uh, in a time in history uh, is always uh, just something very rewarding to come in, uh, certainly as the superintendent, and see the work that has gone on, mm -hmm. not only with the students, but with your teachers and all the support up at Brockton High School. So congratulations to your classmates. Dr. Murray, congratulations on another successful academic event at the high school. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and I'm going to follow that up with uh, a number of presentations this evening. Uh, the first one is going to be a Title I presentation. And the reason this is critical is I was mentioning this today at our executive team meeting. We have had Title I funding for as long as I can remember back into the 60s when Title I came into existence. And one of the things we do is we take for granted that this funding comes from the federal government to support the neediest students all over our country. And what we do each year is, you know, you wait for a census report, you look at the population, but usually it is an increase in funding. So one of the things that we heard when I attended the case conference uh, back in early December um, from a gentleman who is in a think tank in Washington, D.C., and looks at and projects information about the funding. And it was very, very clear that this is not a fund, and again, I'm talking 60 years going back, that we can take for granted. So I think it's important that we are out there publicly talking about what Title I does in each one of our schools. And you will hear us talk about not only Title I uh, supporting our schools, uh, Title IIA, which is professional development or support for our staff, um, Title III for our bilingual students, and Title IV is a new entitlement grant for supporting social and emotional learning. So this evening, uh, I know we had hoped uh, Karen McCarthy would be here. I know June Saber McGuire is stepping in. Unfortunately, we are seeing rampant flu uh, in the Brockton Public Schools uh, with our staff. Um, so again, uh, I thank June for stepping in. Uh, she will talk to you and give you an overview. Uh, of Title I, but we're also inviting Principal Natalie Pohl, I know she's got a number of her staff members, her coaching staff members out there, um, to talk about how these funds are used. And again, it's important, and as we go through our budget cycle, and if you recall, we get Title I funding um, recommendations or uh, entitlements, usually we find out in July. But this year, we're very much going to be doing advocacy for our Title I funds. In a state such as Massachusetts with uh, Senator um, Elizabeth Warren and Senator Markey, um, we will be contacting their offices and making sure that the Title I funds remain the support for districts, certainly like Brockton, that count on it for so much that you'll see this evening. Okay. So as Superintendent Smith said, I'm going to um, go ahead and give you an overview of how Title I funds support the district in general, and then Principal Pohl is going to talk about how Title I funds support the George School, but as she is um, taking the time to explain that to you and talk about the importance of that funding and how it supports the students and the faculty at the George School, um, hopefully you'll be able to take away from that how these funds support all of our elementary schools. 
So again, sort of a little bit of history. Title I is the oldest and largest program in the country, and it, is, um, it was designed to provide additional funds to school districts to improve student achievement in high poverty schools, and it began in 1965. In 1978, um, we were allowed to use Title, Fund, Title I funds to serve all students in, a low, in low achieving high poverty schools. And what that means, and I actually think back to you know, my own early days in the Brockton schools is um, we would target specific students and we still do that, but before 1978, the students that were targeted for additional support had to qualify through being identified as a high poverty student. And that's not the case anymore because all of our schools are actually Title I schools. So a school must have at least a 40% poverty rate in order to be able to qualify um, as a school-wide program. And as I said, all of Brockton schools qualify. As far as the number of students in a school, schools with 100 students or less actually do not need to be served through Title I funds. Um, so the Title I Part A, the Local Education Agency, I have to thank Karen for giving me a lesson in some of our acronyms today because I did have discussion with her. The LEA, which in this case is us, Brockton, we must maintain fiscal effort with state and local funds through what we call maintenance of effort or MOE. And the maintenance of effort requires that an LA, LEA, and in this case, again, that's Brockton, maintain its expenditures for public education from state and local funds from one year to the next. So in essence, an LEA, and again, that's us, Brockton, cannot reduce what we're spending and replace those funds with federal funds because that's what, and I know we've talked about this in the past, that's exactly what supplanting is. So in other words, we couldn't eliminate a fourth grade teacher at let's say the George School and replace that teacher through Title I funding. That would be the definition of supplanting. So again, Title I is meant to supplement but not supplant state and local funds. In Brockton, all 11 of our elementary schools are supported through Title I funding and Title I funding um, must service all schools that have over 75% poverty before it serves any schools with less than 75% poverty. Unless the district can prove a school is receiving additional supplementary funds that would support other services. This doesn't really um, pertain to Brockton, but that would be a case, um, for example, uh, like the Gilmore School. That's an expanded learning time school that does receive additional funds through expanded learning time grant money. So as far as comparability is concerned, the state requires that we demonstrate what they call comparability by using a student to instructional staff ratio. This information has to be reported every year to the state in order for us to be able to receive our Title I funding. And in Brockton, we do this by comparing high poverty schools to low poverty schools. And what they mean by comparability and student to teacher ratio is that all of our schools have to have the same student to teacher ratio uh, regardless of its um, poverty rating before we can allocate Title I funds to um, any of our Title I schools, which are all of them. Um, so for example, the Brookfield, Brookfield, Hancock, and Kennedy are used as our, our low poverty comparisons at the elementary level, and I actually just jotted down some of those um, poverty rates right before I left, and the Hancock is 46.3%, the Brookfield is at 52.7%, and the Kennedy is um, at 43.5%. So those are our low poverty comparison schools. Now, federally funded grant positions are excluded from comparability, meaning your special education teachers that are, fund, uh, that are funded through grants our instructional leadership coaches, um, our language acquisition coaches, those folks that are funded through federal funds, federal grant money can't be compared or included when we're looking at the student to instructional staff ratio. 
and it only staff that are paid with our state and local funds, Chapter 70, and um, city money can be counted. And if a school is not comparable, if it was found that a school wasn't meeting the expectations for the student to staff ratio, then as a district, we would actually have to move, we, we could have to move a teacher to a school, a different school. Now again, that hasn't happened in Brockton. So as far as comparability, um, the people that are included in this determination are our principals, our assistant principals, our guidance and adjustment counselors, any of our support content teachers, classroom teachers, long-term substitutes. Those are the folks that are really funded through our local and Chapter 70 monies. For this year, our Title I funding for FY18 is based on the title is based on the 2015 census. And so according to the 2015 census, Brockton is at a 25.1% poverty rate. Um, the next census takes place in 2020. Obviously, I think that highlights the importance of making sure that we provide the type of supports that we need out in our schools and our community to be sure that our, our um, residents are actually completing the census because it really does make a big difference in our Title I allocation. So for, again, 2000 FY 2018, our, our Title I allocation was $5,820,869. Um, from that allocation, there are reservations that have to be made for family engagement, so at least 1% of that total amount has to be dedicated to family engagement in our schools. 4.4% uh, is dedicated to administrative services, and 1% toward our indirect costs. As far as private schools are concerned, um, we have one Title I teacher at Trinity Catholic, two tutors at Seventh-day Adventist, and one tutor at St. Bridget's in Abington. And that's because our Title I funds actually follow our Brockton students. And so we are required to allocate our, our per pupil expenditure that we would have had those students been in Brockton. So those are our, our Brockton kids attending those schools. Um, the Title I budget also is able to fund our 22 instructional leadership coaches. 11 of those coaches are STEM coaches, science, technology, engineering, and math, and 11 of those coaches are literacy coaches. We also have 18 reading teachers in our elementary schools, and again, these are people who hold their master's degrees in reading, and they are really dedicated to providing additional support and literacy for our students. Um, we also have one administrator that's funded through Title I, that's Karen McCarthy. She's our coordinator, obviously, of Title I. And Karen has two administrative assistants who help to support that grant, in addition to all of the um, the administrative requirements connected to McKinney Vinto. We also this year new have 11 parent engagement liaisons in our schools. Um, these are really our teachers and this is a stipended position and I'm sure Mrs. Pohl plans on talking a little bit or she didn't, I don't know if she can, about what her parent engagement liaison has been able to do at the George School this year because that's a little bit of a difference from what we had in the past with the hope that the teachers that are performing these, um, these positions, that are in these positions are able to really offer the type of parent engagement opportunities for the parents in their schools and really kind of get to know what is it that the families are looking for and what's going to bring them into the schools. So in addition to just salaries, really Title I money supports all aspects of the costs related to these funded positions. So connected to salaries are health, dental, and life insurance. Uh, the longevity that's connected to any one person that has one of these positions, sick leave buyback, 
um, mass teachers retirement system and also stipends that might be connected to particular positions and for instance with our coaches they do get a two thousand dollar stipend plus they're all they also come in a week before the rest of the teachers do and that's in order obviously to support their principals and uh, they're paid at for one week at their per diem rate of pay Title I also funds professional development, instructional resources, and also any costs that are related to McKinney-Vinto that aren't connected to transportation. But I think you can see that, I mean, it's really a wide range of, um, of services that Title I provides for us in the school district, particularly at the elementary level. And so now we thought it would be important to have Principal Pohl talk about how these funds really support the positions that are impacting the um, delivery of services really to our, the students in our schools. All right. Uh, first, I want to acknowledge our team members that were able to come tonight. Unfortunately, Mrs. Enos, our assistant principal, uh, she's down for the count, so hopefully she does not have the flu, but stay tuned. Uh, we uh, have Diane Alskinis is here. Uh, she is our literacy coach. <laughs> and Michelle Zachary is our STEM coach at the George School. Uh, and they, these ladies are um, just so incredibly important to the, to the work that we do uh, every single day. They are our leadership team, uh, along with the principal and the assistant principal. Um, they assist us in ensuring that all aspects of the curricular are delivered. Um, so if we're talking about Reader's Workshop, uh, REACH, Foundations, Math Workshop, uh, Engineering is Elementary, these are sure, um, sure things that you already know about. Um, but these initiatives, um, they make sure are implemented and supported uh, in our school. They also uh, go into classrooms, they model lessons, they observe instruction, they provide non-evaluative feedback uh, for teachers about instruction, um, and it's all about meeting those individual needs of, of the children. Um, also new this year, they teach uh, two classes each day uh, that support school and district initiatives. Uh, here at the bottom, there are a couple of pictures of uh, students testing parachutes in Ms. Zachary's uh, STEM class uh, with our fifth grade. Um, in addition, they also um, support teachers and they provide instructional mentoring and coaching uh, in classrooms. They conduct professional development workshops um, on half days uh, during our um, professional learning team time um, and they support those and facilitate those team meetings. Um, they analyze data, um, they're collaboratively planning with teachers um, to provide high quality and rigorous lessons. They're examining student work products um, to calibrate performance and improve uh, student achievement. That picture down in the, uh, the bottom is, is from one of our um, data walks that we did where we looked at all of uh, the data uh, in our school, all of the summative data, MCAS, uh, STAR testing. We looked at writing samples. Um, so we had a very deep dive uh, into our data and where teachers were guided through uh, various rooms and, and um, looking at strengths and weaknesses and, and really um, deciding on an instructional focus uh, for our professional learning teams and that is all um, guided by the coaches. And they're also very important uh, in supporting us with um, statewide testing. Uh, as you heard our uh, student representative earlier talking about uh, access testing uh, is happening this month. So they are um, uh, really important in helping us support that. At the George School, we're testing over 300 students um, for, the, for the WIDA access testing. Uh, and then in addition to our coaches, we have at our school uh, two Title I teachers. They provide critical uh, literacy support for struggling readers in grades one, two th uh, one through three. Uh, and they're using various research-based interventions such as foundations and leveled literacy. Uh, and new to their contract this year, they're also um, teaching up to three classes a day. This is um, not counting their small group intervention time. 
Um, so our Title I teachers are going in and providing whole group literacy lessons uh, in grades three through four on specific skills that have been identified um, with those grade level teachers. And that support um, has been really important. This, this uh, graph shows some growth uh, in one of our grade one groups using the STAR testing. Uh, and you can see in this uh, little graph we have uh, five friends who have all shown growth in their STAR testing. We're hoping to see even more. Um, that's just from the fall to the winter, um, but we expect an even bigger jump uh, for the springtime. And the graph on the bottom, you can, you can kind of see, um, shows students' categories, uh, reading categories have moved. So one student who had, um, and I don't have my glasses on, but one student who started off in the early emergent uh, category, she has moved all the way up to a transitional reader. Um, and then we have other students that have moved from late emergent to um, transitional reader. So they're really making big gains uh, in a small amount of time, and it's, it's so important um, to have those teachers and coaches working directly with students. And then as Mrs. Saber McGuire mentioned, the parent engagement specialist as well, that's a new position. I'm sorry, I don't have a slide for it. But um, we have a fourth grade teacher um, who is our liaison, uh, and we've planned a couple of events already. We held a STEM night for grades three through five um, with a company called Lego Playtech. Um, we had really great feedback uh, from parents, so we're planning another STEM night using one of our teachers. Uh, Mr. Gelfie is going to uh, be offering a science night. We also have bingo for books planned. Um, we have a parent meeting. Uh, we're calling it Convivencia, which is um, a Spanish for a, like a gathering, uh, where we're bringing families together um, a lot. We have a lot of families that are new to the country, um, and so we're going to be delivering um, this meeting in Spanish uh, with our community facilitator uh, and a family advocate and really finding out what the needs of those families are, what types of things they want more information on so that will inform future meetings uh, and our parent liaison is helping us uh, to plan and organize that as well. So we're really excited to have that position in our building to, to really tailor um, things specific to our school community. So I think that, um, well, hopefully you can see how important the Title I funds are really in supporting so many of our staff members across really the entire district because, as I said earlier, all 11 of our elementary schools are Title I schools, and they are all being provided with these types of, of certainly resources that are leading to improve student performance and really supporting our, our teachers in their own professional growth. So we're happy to answer any questions. I know some of the technical um, information might, have, might lead to some questions. Appreciate the, the time and effort it took you to put this together and it was very informative. Um, when the superintendent was introducing you, she mentioned Title II, Three, and Four, um, and I know that wasn't the topic for tonight, but what I, I was curious about is the um, purpose of those three, and if you happen to know roughly how much money we get? Well, we're actually going to have a presentation for a school committee on each one of the grants. So tonight was Title I, so we will be presenting about Title, for Title II, and um, I actually did talk to our, our Director of Bilingual Education, Kelly Jones, who's here this evening, and she'll be presenting about Title III. And Title IV really is connected to Title I and Title II, so, when um, Karen McCarthy is able to come, we'll actually do another presentation that gives an overview of all of those grants. All right, great, thank you. Ms. Plant. Thank you. The Title I funds that we receive, are they typically the same each year? Do you expect any change in that? Well, th that's a really great question. They've, they've been pretty consistent, but one of the things that I think the superintendent mentioned earlier is that the, um, the person who presented to us at the Title I conference talked about the importance of us not taking these grants for granted. <laughs> 
and that we really needed to have a strong message as a district about how important these funds are in supporting many much of the work that's happening in our schools. So we like to think it's consistent, but the message that we were given was not to take it for granted and to be sure that we're really advocating both at the state and federal level to continue this level of funding and really hopefully increased funding. Have we ever heard this type of message before? Has there been a year that we have not received these funds? Or? There, there hasn't. Historically, there has not been a situation where that's occurred, and, and that really was, I think, the message that we were given at the Title I conference, that there is a shifting political climate and that we needed to be out in front of advocating for making sure that these funds continue to support the work in our schools. Thank you very much. We've been following this for a while, and even going back last year, um, we were told, and of course you saw the presentation with Title I, under Title IIA, that's um, quite a bit of money that does support um, associate principals, um, it supports some of our coaching positions up at Brockton High School, uh, and that was a deficit this year and we, that was taken by surprise of close to $450,000. And of course, in looking back at the rhetoric that went on last March and April into May, we thought we were gonna be clear for this past year, but there were comments made by your Secretary uh, of Education, Betsy DeVos, out there wondering why districts need Title IIA. You know, is that money well spent? Well, if you come out and you look at a district like a Brockton and many more, you know, certainly in, in Massachusetts, that is money well spent. It's making a difference as far as supporting curriculum. You'll have your retreat on the 27th and we're gonna be talking about our action plan and supporting the curriculum and the instruction and the achievement gaps in our school. So again, um, I, we just feel having had conversations back in early December, we can take none of this for granted. We wanted to make sure that we were clear this evening about the Title I funds. We'll continue to talk about Title IIA, Title III, Title IV, and just as we advocated with our state funds last year, our local funds, we'll be making sure that there is advocacy with our federal funds. Unfortunately for us, our certainly our um, senators you know, are in support of the Title I funding, but we'll be talking to Stephen Lynch, our representatives, and making sure there is a strong push to keep this money in place, which again has been since we said 1965, has supported you know, rural communities, suburban communities, urban communities, high poverty communities. Uh, Principal Pohl, how are you? How are you? Good. Um, in terms of the number of staff in your school who um, are funded by Title I, can you just tell us approximately how many and what positions in terms of uh, you know support additional support I believe it's it's the two coaches the literacy and, and the stem it. coach and the two title one teachers okay that's and cool. is that consistent throughout the district or do some elementary schools have more I, I know that the coaches are all the same each building has two coaches um, title one teachers can vary based on the um, poverty rate of, of the school? It's pretty consistent across the district. There are a few differences, but not much. It's, we try to be as consistent as we can, based on the number of students in a school as well. And in your professional opinion, obviously as a principal, you certainly see the value in having that added um, assistance to the a daily Absolutely. Regiment. I could be up here advocating for, for even more. Uh, in a building of, let's say, I think we hit 933 the other day, so we certainly are the largest um, K-5 to school. Um, we could definitely argue for, or advocate rather, for more, for more support. So again, the other thing here, and that is when you talk about you know, equity, that is where we have difficulty. So in a school, when you talk about some elementary schools of 560, you know, and then you talk about almost double the size, and yet we don't have double, we, we don't have the staff. You know, frankly, we could certainly use numbers of Title I teachers that could support instruction in each of our elementary schools. Anyone else? No? Mr. Sullivan. I'd just like to say 
you did a real good job, both of you. It was a uh, real interest. I didn't realize Title I was so, <coughs> excuse me, so involved and does so much throughout the, the district. It isn't funny. It, my question is, is Title I in jeopardy right now? Well, thank you, Mr. Sullivan. But it could be in jeopardy, which was really the strong, I think, message that we took away from the Title I conference. Again, not to take anything for granted and to really have a strong message as far as our um, reliance on this grant money to be able to support our schools because I can think that you can hear from Principal Pohl, imagine if we pulled four, if we lost our Title I funding, that would mean we would lose four positions in just one school of 900 students, over 900 students. So the message, really the takeaway from us was really to, to absolutely be out there and, and advocating to make sure that our, as the superintendent said, our legislators continue to advocate for that funding, which as she said, we're fortunate that, that that's happening. I would recommend we as a school committee uh, file a resolve that we send to all of our elected officials, not just at our, our state level, but at the federal level, um, you know, putting together what that money is used for in the Brockton Public Schools and the differences that it has made. So we will start under advocacy, uh, putting together those letters, and we can uh, work on that in the next month or so. But that's something we should be filing very soon. Good idea. Great. Anyone else? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd like to uh, also invite up, when we were here uh, on January 2nd, I did talk to you about a grant for $25,000 uh, from the uh, Silicon Valley Community Foundation. And I do have the director of our bilingual uh, department, uh, Kelly Jones, coming down very slowly. <laughs> but she is back, and we welcome her back. And I think she can update you. And when you look at the grants, tonight we talked about a $10,000 Bill Belichick grant. When you look at $25,000, you know, I, it is so impressive that all of our departments, it doesn't matter if it's a small grant, if it benefits our student in any way, we are out there looking. Um, you know, filling out the applications, putting together and telling our story, because every little bit does help. Thank you for having me, and I, I'm, I'm glad to be back on two feet. Um, so, as you might remember, on November 23rd, the, the governor signed the Look Act, which uh, enables districts to have much more flexibility in offering programming for English learners. Um, there was a, a um, an article published by the Enterprise that highlighted how Brockton kind of beat the state to the to the bilingual punch, and it highlighted all of the wonderful things that Brockton has to offer um, in terms of programming and valuing the bilingualism that's needed for the 21st century. So. About a week and a half after, I got a phone call from um, a woman named Rosa who preferred to remain anonymous. Um, and she said that she worked for a foundation um, that again preferred to remain anonymous. But um, in the season of giving, she wanted to see about what are some of the, um, the challenges that bilingual students face in, uh, in Brockton Public Schools. Um, I don't know if it was related to the Enterprise article, but it was very, you know, very closely aligned to the release of this article. So I, I, I wonder if there was any kind of connection there. So we had a really uh, interesting conversation about what are some of the, de the, the demands of the 21st century, particularly around technology, that um, our students need to be able to be proficient in in order to be academically successful and gain their diploma. So um, I went on my, my, my merry way. We had a great conversation and um, recovering from surgery and Mike Thomas got a letter from the uh, Silicon Valley Community Foundation indicating that an, an anonymous fund um, wished to donate $25,000 to Brockton High School to be utilized for t either technology or um, Para, native language support, native language paraprofessionals. Um, so when I came, I, I was very excited and communicating with 
uh, Deputy Superintendent Thomas throughout the next the next um, few days. And then uh, when I got back to work, we we convened a team that involved Deputy Superintendent Thomas, uh, the Director of Technology Dan Vigent, the bilingual department head. Uh, Christina de Novaish, as well as Kevin DuPont, the uh, CVTE and Technology Coordinator, uh, Director. So we wanted to see how can we use this, this money to really best serve the needs of the English learners. And um, the team came up with, uh, I think, a really innovative plan to support and supplement the technology work that's already in, going on at the high school. So what we're going to establish um, is a bilingual resource center for students, particularly those in the beginning and early intermediate levels of English proficiency, to instead of going to a directed academics where their teacher may or may not speak their, their native language um, and, and may or may not be able to support them through this, uh, this transition, um, they'd be able to be assigned a bilingual resource center that would have a um, have computers, have potentially have language acquisition software, have an ESL teacher, and, and, and potentially a math or science bilingual teacher available. So, so in that way, we can really target our resources long term over time to the needs, both social, emotional, academic, and technological needs of our newly arrived students and help really prepare them for the, um, you know, the, the digital demands required for graduation. So I thought that was a really wonderful um, plan that we put in place. The, the goal is to be able to identify location this, this spring. Uh, I'll be working with the, the director of technology to identify the, the hardware and the software that makes the most sense for the high school. And then hopefully we'll ha be able to launch it in uh, September. Any questions? Well, again, thank you because we've talked endlessly again about the challenges of technology, uh, about uh, instruction, um, and this will certainly, mm. again, twenty-five thousand dollars will go a long way to continue to support our students. Um, you know, thank you for not only being highlighted, as Kelly said. Um, you know, our programs are highlighted throughout the state. When you talk, we were together at uh, a meeting in Marlboro on Friday where they presented about the look bill coming in which was the article that was written uh, in the Enterprise, uh, highlighting really the transformation in Brockton is going to be really easy for us because we have a lot of best practices. And they were highlighted in front of all the urban superintendents last Friday. Some of them talking about, we've talked about the international school, uh, our dual language programs. So all of these things has put us in a position that um, we very comfortably will implement this uh, law going forward. And I want to thank Kelly and her whole department for always being innovative and creative and will continue to support our English language learners. Thank you. So. Thank you. Thank you. And next I would like to uh, call up our new uh, web content manager, uh, Seamus Clifford, and our communications director, Michelle Bolton. Uh, Seamus has been in the job probably a little over a month, I think, at this point. Um, and he has really hit the ground running. Uh, Michelle gets very excited when we talk about some of the changes that we had to take a look at because of mandates um, of the way that our website is viewed. Uh, Seamus has stepped in. Uh, there's been creativity. There's you know, talk about expanding uh, information that we share with our community. So what I asked them to do tonight before we actually launch this is to come and show the school committee our intranet. So we, of course, know that with Final Site back a year or so ago, we launched our new and updated website. And this is, again, internally our intranet. So I'm going to step aside and let Seamus and, Seamus and Michelle. Right, that's exactly right. Good evening, everybody. Uh, it's great to see you all. Coach Clifford is our wonderful new web content manager. And uh, he's been with us just, just a couple of months. And um, he's brought a great creativity to the communications office. Uh, before he came in, we had Kathy Ettinger, who was wonderful, but who had worked part time. And when we launched the redesign, uh, we brought over about 20% of what had been on the former website. 
and our task was to build from a skeleton level our pages uh, of the public site and the intranet. And Kathy did a wonderful job and decided that she wanted to retire, uh, well deserved. Um, and so when Seamus came in, uh, he had a, a pretty Herculean task ahead of him and he has just taken the ball and run with it. And uh, not only with the public site, which um, he is working really hard to enhance and add resources, but uh, what we want to show you tonight is the intranet, which is uh, our internal site for students and staff, which you normally wouldn't see. And uh, I think Seamus wants to give you a, a look at uh, the before and after uh, of, our, of our staff page and then also of the, of the student page. And I'll, I'll toss it to you and you can talk about um, what, how you've done and, and um, your ideas on that. Absolutely. So uh, I'd like to thank you guys first for the kind words earlier. Mr. Minicello and Mr. Gormley. Um, but this is what the, the intranet, which is only accessible to teachers, looked like at the beginning of December. And it's kind of scary looking. There's a nice green screen going on, some uh, weird links that kind of look mysterious. And then you kind of scroll down, and here's all the PD offerings. And as a millennial, it definitely scares me to just see text like that. Um, so I kind of, my goal was to just kind of revamp it, you know, make it look a little bit better, easier on the eyes. Talk a yeah. little bit about the links and what they do. Um, oh yeah, so this, this link would go to your email. This one would go back to the website. Um, Wikispaces, which is um, an older resource that I don't think too many people use anymore. And this would go to a series of forms. Um, our library catalog, each school has different resources that they can use on Destiny. Discovery Ed is used by many teachers and administrators. Data Resources has some useful links for um, getting data. Infinite Campus is where all the grading is done and um, behavior referrals and where students can um, see their grades and how they're doing on assignments. Um, there's Human Resources, which has um, job ads posting, fingerprinting information and other information and useful links and so on and so forth. Um, so let me show you um, what I've done and created. It's a little bit easier on the eyes, I hope. Um, the biggest links right here are front and center. Um, your email, um, Microsoft Word, um, Excel, all of that is within Office 365. Um, you can go right onto Infinite Campus. You can go through our telephone directory and link back to the BPS website. And then along our left side here, we have technology links. If it'll load. These are all alphabetized. It's a little bit cleaner and neater and easier to kind of navigate through. And below it are our internet safety resources from the technology department. And all of our forms are here. Again, featured forms are at the top, the most used ones. And then there's a brand new how-to page where I've added some resources like how to use your Office 365 in email, how to call in sick, and so on and so forth. And then our human resources page definitely looks a little bit cleaner. Um, and as you scroll down, you can see you can apply online. Um, these will provide other helpful links and send you to our, our website, uh, the, the public website. And these kind of pop up with, with more information that was kind of lost within the old intranet. And one of my favorite parts is the new professional development page where we kind of have these wells of information. Um, so this is a, uh, a resource that was provided where students, uh, staff can um, learn how to clean up their computers and, and chaos in life and, and deal with stress, um, CPI, recertification, so on and so forth. And it's all a little bit neater. It was kind of was my goal. So it's easier for teachers to access. Um, and there's also the, the student intranet was redone, which you can access from the, from the staff intranet. Um, it kind of looks a little dark on there. It's actually the same red color that was was previous, but
But again, kind of the same thing where the featured uh, links are up front and center. And then as you scroll through on this left side, you can go to your ELA resources, your math resources, reading, and so on and so forth, and then link back to the public website. Um, and another important thing that I wanted to focus on, especially, was the, um, I hooked up Google Analytics. We didn't have this before, but this way we can track what teachers and students are clicking on. So for example, um, Discovery Ed. It's a resource, a resource, like I said earlier, that a bunch of teachers and administrators use. And when I, if I was to click on this, it would trigger an event. And I could track how many people use Discovery Ed as opposed to Envisions or, or Fast Math. And we can kind of make better decisions on what we need to purchase or what we kind of need to shy away from or promote for teachers and students. Do you have anything to add, Michelle? No, I yeah. think uh, I think it's a, a great difference. Um, even just the the kid friendly icons, it's it's a big difference. Uh, we've had some great feedback from um, June Saber McGuire's staff. Um, we've had some input, move things around a little bit. You know, we've really welcomed everybody's input. Um, trying to work together with everyone to see what folks would like us to add. And we've just put the word out there that you know we're here to serve. And um, you know, Seamus is meeting with a lot of the departments at the high school. He's traveling to the schools, helping me out, covering some of the activities. So we're really working as a team to get out there and be visible. So you know, we're able to make a lot of changes on the site, make it a lot more useful, put a lot more resources on there. And um, you know, so far so good. Does anybody have any questions for Seamus? I don't really have a question because I do not know much about technology yeah. at all. But um, I have to say that I'm really impressed that you put on a tracking where we can really see which programs are being used. Um, that seems like it's going to be a very useful feature. And I'm hoping maybe at, um, at an upcoming meeting we could get a little feedback on that after some time. So yes, definitely. That's a great addition. Thank you very much. I wish I could have brought some data with me, but it's only been a, just a few days, so none of it would have mm -hmm. been quite useful yet. Well, great. Thank you very much. Yeah, Good no work. Problem. Thank you. Um, just like Ms. Plant had just indicated, when we were on the accounts review committee, um, we wondered sometimes which programs the teachers were using um, and which programs we could probably do without. So that tracking is going to be wonderful to at least see where um, maybe we need to invest more money in some of the programs that are um, more utilized. But this is very, very refreshing. And having it under a short time, you've done so much in a short period of time. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This evening, Aldo Petronio is meeting, uh, representing us at City Hall. Uh, the appropriation of $385,995 from the Stabilization Fund to support our non-net school spending uh, is happening uh, as we speak before the City Council. On a good note, um, I re remember meeting with you last summer and talking about a $250,000 appropriation that had been put in the state budget by our representatives uh, Cronin uh, and Cassidy and supported by Representative Dubois. Um, and when the budget cuts came in, that was cut out of the budget, which was shocking to me to the tune of $250,000 with the budget deficit that we were facing. Um, what had happened was, you know, as it went through the Senate and the House again, it was put back in the budget. It survived both the House and the Senate. And we were notified uh, on Thursday of last week that the $250,000 is being put into a special account. It's almost like drawn out like a grant account through the uh, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, but $250,000 has been put in an account for the Brockton Public Schools to be utilized each month and to be drawn down. Um, we haven't met to discuss what that will be used for, but we will do that uh, very quickly. So I'm very pleased. I'll get a note out to our representatives and thank them uh, along with uh, Senator Brady who supported it when it went through the Senate. 
Um, so looking back last year, you will remember that was one of the figures that we kept looking at that money. Um, on another note, um, not such a positive note, uh, districts uh, all around, uh, including Brockton, are looking at a possible uh, deficit in what they call the special education circuit breaker account. So we are looking at that very carefully. That is to support many of our students that have severe special needs uh, and need special instruction, um, special uh, curriculum, et cetera. And that is something that every school system counts on to support the cost of your special education in a district. So when we're looking at the budget coming up, that is not an account that we would need any kind of a deficit and those figures are not um, decreasing, they're increasing. So this is all over the state and there is advocacy going on. Brockton will be putting together a letter uh, informing uh, Governor Baker uh, that that, again, is an account that is important to certainly us as a district. Any questions on, on th those monies? When did you say that um, we would be able to start drawing down on those funds on a monthly basis? Uh, immediately. Okay. So we were notified, as I said, January 11th, uh, last Thursday that the money, I was in touch with uh, Representative Cronin as we were watching it go through not only the House and the Senate, but she had also sent a letter to the governor asking him to make sure that that was made available to us at, as it had made it through both the House and the Senate. So I was very pleased to, to finally receive that, that uh, notification. Um, also, uh, looking at upcoming things, I had talked to you about the uh, search to replace uh, Commissioner Chester last time when we were here. Um, I have met with a number of urban superintendents. It's very clear that we want to make sure today they believe, I haven't even looked yet, but they have made, I think, an announcement in the next day or two of three finalists. <laughs> they did. Do, do, you, do you know who, who they are? Jeff Riley, who's the receiver, and Lawrence. Um, was one of the finalists, or he is the receiver in Lawrence. Um, there's a woman from Texas who's the Texas Education Agency Special Ed Department head, and a woman who's the um, dep a deputy superintendent of New York Public Schools or New York State Schools. Um, okay, so I have it right here. Thank okay. you, Mr. Gormley. Thank goodness for your uh, <laughs> memory. Uh, I could have three finalists that. I was just reading before I left. Angelica <laughs> Infante Green, uh, Deputy Commissioner of the Office of Instructional Support, New York State Education Department. Uh, Jeffrey C. Riley, uh, Superintendent Receiver of the Lawrence Public Schools. I'm very familiar with Jeffrey. Uh, and Penny uh, Schwinn, uh, Chief Deputy Commissioner of Academics at the State of Texas uh, Education Agency. They were picked from a pool of 18 applicants from around the country. Uh, so that being stated, one of the things that they're looking for, there will be public interviews on the uh, 26th of January uh, at the Parker House. Uh, I will be there. Um, I will be representing uh, our urban su superintendents and talking about how important it is for the relationship with the commissioner, with not just certainly the urban superintendents, but superintendents, school districts. Um, we're going to put together um, a, a statement uh, talking about accessibility, <coughs> uh, making sure that the commissioner is out in the districts looking at the work that's going on. Um, so again, we will be uh, represented at the January 26th meeting at the Parker House. I want to remind everybody again about the a couple of things. Uh, tomorrow evening, um, hopefully uh, weather cooperates with us, but we do have the superintendent forum happening at East Middle School. That is from uh, 6 to 8 o'clock p.m. We're doing four of them this year. We've already done West Middle School. This is East. We'll continue, I believe, in March and again in May. That is not to be confused with our parent forum that is going to be taking place on the 24th of January right here at Brockton High School from uh, 6 to 7.30 p.m. We had training the other day for a number of our parents, uh, school administrative support, um, so parents will be conducting uh, some of the focus groups and sharing information on uh, different topics that we've put out there in our survey. I want to remind everybody that that survey, and I want to thank Seamus uh, and Michelle, uh, that survey was put up on our website. I know as of the other day we had over a thousand people that had filled out the survey. I'm sure that's increased and we again will leave it open until January 19th where we'll be gathering all the data for the uh, 24th of January uh, forum. Um, 
I also want to um, remind everybody that uh, that we have um, our retreat coming up on the 27th. We're very busy putting our agenda together. Again, if there are any items that you want to include uh, on that uh, agenda, please get them to me as soon as possible. As we're looking at a time from probably 8 to 12, we're trying to keep a, a very focused time uh, for that uh, for that particular meeting. I also want to congratulate, again, I got a note from Coach John Fidalgo. He's so good about informing all of us. So this past weekend, and Mr. Gormley, you'll probably talk about this, but I know that they were number three in Division I State Relay Championship. Yes. And we had, uh, did you attend? No, I didn't get to go to that one. Um, I'll probably go to the, the Division I meet, which is coming up in about a month. Well, they continue to shine, and, and certainly I thank the coach for his wonderful support of instruction for our students. And again, those numbers just continue to increase and in opportunities for our students to take part in a sport. Um, Mr. Minicello, I know you have a couple of things, but I want to finish up by um, making a statement. And I do know that the mayor has publicly put out a statement. But um, you hear me talk often about being in the Brockton Public Schools for certainly my whole career. And although this city has changed from when I began in 1977, the feeling is still the same. You heard us open up this evening and talk about us being a family and caring about what goes on in people's lives. I assure you that I'm out there each and every day. I look at our wonderful students from Shama Arace, who represents so wonderfully our students at Brockton High School, the hard work, the success that you will be, from our littlest students who are in our classes and come from nations all over the world and make up our Brockton community. I want to be very clear that the dialogue going on in the nation uh, is not something that we certainly support here for our children. Our children are welcomed, they're intelligent, they will become people that are very productive in our society and contribute wonderful, wonderful things. So I just want to make sure that parents understand that and understand what the Brockton Public School is all about. And I join the mayor in saying that it is very divisive when we are very proud to teach our children to be patriotic, you know, to be proud of the country that they're from, and the comments that were made or were shared uh, with us. Um, I understand uh, at this point, and I'm not going to get into politics about this, but again, uh, I, we are a welcoming public school system, educate every student that comes through our doors, and we're proud of what makes up our Brockton community. And that is my report for this evening. Very well said. Um, on another note, um, we certainly have heard uh, the good news about our boys' soccer soccer team, our champion state champion team. Um, just as an announcement, there is going to be a gala dinner, so a gala, I guess, a gala dinner. Um, and that is going to be at the Massasoit Conference Center on Saturday, February 3rd from 7 p.m. to 11 p.m. Um, there are tickets available, uh, $30 for BHS students and $45 for other guests. Um, you can um, uh, go on our website and you will find the information in terms of how to obtain those tickets. And um, there is also a fundraising drive uh, for the team, um, there is a um, donation schedule, but any donations certainly would be welcome. Um, you can contact um, Moises Rodriguez, uh, Soraya Devaros, or Louis Lopes, and again, their information will be available on the website. And um, that money uh, will go, obviously, to defer some of the costs of the dinner. Um, and also, I believe that um, uh, people would like to send the boys um, on a trip. Um, so we, um, we welcome uh, anyone that would like to donate. And um, uh, please celebrate with the team on um, February 3rd over at Massasoit Conference Center. Um, uh, the mayor did express his regrets, as the superintendent pointed out. He is um, at City Hall. Uh, with the City Council, I believe, talking numbers uh, with Mr. Petronio. Um, so uh, he regrets that he couldn't be here this evening. Um, 
Uh, any, any predictions on school tomorrow, superintendents? <laughs> So I know that it will be a long night. You know, we are, this is probably hotter than when you look at a blizzard coming and we sit and we have discussion and it's pretty clear when it's going to hit and the impact that it will have. So when you look at the news uh, at six o'clock, this of course is right now, for those of you watching, it is uh, Tuesday, uh, January 16th. So as we watched the six o'clock news, it looked like it could be anywhere from two to four inches, it could change to rain. So we will have a long night ahead of ourselves, myself and Deputy Superintendent Thomas, you know, watching that, uh, certainly talking with the mayor's office, with the DPW. Um, they do such a good job of informing us and keeping us updated. I wanna remind parents all winter long that we do whatever we can to get children to school safely, but we also do have delays built into our um, schedules. So uh, we will communicate with you if necessary, uh, either school is on or possibly delays or, you know, again, we deal with the New England weather on a pretty regular basis. I think we're all pretty good at it at this point. And, but speaking of the calendar, we do have the first draft of the mm -hmm. academic calendar for next yep, year, I which that. I cannot believe it's 2018-19 academic <clears throat> calendar. So this is the first read. Okay, so is this something that you need a vote on this evening, or uh, do you? It, it is a draft, um, just really for your information. Okay, so just informational if purposes. If anyone sees anything, and again, we have lots of eyes that look at this. We're obviously looking at the calendar at this point here. We do not start until after Labor Day. I will remind everybody in the teacher's contract, it does state that we cannot begin school until uh, September 1st. So where September 1st, I believe, is uh, either, I think, on the Saturday. So obviously, we can't start ahead of time. So Monday being the holiday, we will start uh, on uh, the teachers coming back on the 3rd, which is, um, excuse me, the 4th, Fourth. which is the Tuesday. Students will come back uh, on the 5th, which is the Wednesday. And those are all students, uh, grades um, 1 through 12. And then our, our pre-K and kindergarten students will start back on September 17th. It's the primary, is that primary? Yes. Okay, and that this is a gubernatorial year, correct? Yes. Okay. All right, so if anyone, um, if, if the committee could take a look at that calendar and get back with any comments or criticisms, and, uh, we can certainly consider those concerns. Okay. Uh, any unfinished, oh, items to refer to subcommittee. Anyone at this time? Ms. Plant. Um, I'm certainly going to miss being on safety, security, and transportation. Um, but I would like to refer to that subcommittee um, in lieu of discussing snow that's coming up. We did have an issue, I feel, um, at the last snow removal to make sure that the schools were cleared before the start of the day. And I would like to refer it to that subcommittee perhaps to con discuss a policy perhaps for, um, to, for checking beforehand before the schools are open to see if, um, if the properties have been cleared properly. And again, you're talking about uh, bus stops, you're talking about um, sidewalks. No, actually, I'm not sure you know, what the reason was. Perhaps it's a fluke and we won't see this issue again because I haven't had this issue. I haven't been aware of this issue before this past storm. But even um, at some of our schools, the sidewalks in front of our schools themselves had not been cleared. So. I know I'm personally thinking, perhaps is there a check that happens in the morning um, to make sure that those are, are cleared? And if not, you know, perhaps we have to make a delay. I think it's so. important that when you schedule, uh, when we schedule the subcommittee, maybe we invite Larry Rowley, okay. who's the head of our DPW. Um, it's quite an operation. Um, he, I know, works very well with us. Um, I know that there were concerns. I know that you were dealing with phone calls. I know Deputy Superintendent was fielding them as quickly as he could and getting them out there to the DPW to begin that work. So I think it would be important to, to allow uh, uh, Director uh, Larry Rowley to come before us. And I would like to thank Mr. Thomas because I know when he was made aware of an issue, he was um, on it immediately and trying to rectify it immediately. And I'm sure he was being pulled in several different directions and um, in handling lots of issues. So thank you very much, Mike. Thank you. And the other thing that I, I want to, to say, and, and obviously this is important, it's always about the, um, certainly the safety of our students, many of them walking to and from school. Not everybody has a ride to school, but we do ask parents, 
and we asked them this beginning in 2015 to please work together in your neighborhoods. If the mounds are so high and there's a bus stop there, stay with the children. You know, it helps to have a parent there so children are not running out in the street or playing in the snow. It's very attractive for them to want to do that. Whether you're, you know, uh, putting a couple of kids in your car or if a neighbor has a car, taking kids to school. So the community has been excellent in supporting us, which is why we are able to somehow survive these larger than not storms we have dealt with the past few years. So, um, you know, I want to thank them again for, for their support. Mr. D'Agostino. Uh, can I just ask, are there any updates on the pending um, equity and education lawsuit since the last meeting? Yes, the update uh, is um, I have a conference call tomorrow, actually, with uh, three of the other urbans who are my counterparts in planning our urban superintendent network meetings. We are presently looking at February 2nd, so I'm trying to firm that up. We've actually got a confirmation from our attorney, a confirmation from Paul Revel, who was the former Secretary of Education, who was actually around during the so-called Grand Bargain, which was your <laughs> equity and education lawsuit back in the late 80s, early 90s. So we're just firming all of that up. And I'll get that out not only to you, but to uh, your counterparts. We'll be inviting other school committees, mayors, um, elected officials. They'll, this will be one of the first meetings. I can guarantee this won't be the only meeting we have. Uh, so we're looking to meet at uh, a Stonehill College uh, property. They have uh, larger areas where we can uh, sponsor uh, this event. Thank you. Yep. Anything else? Under? No? OK. Uh, any unfinished business? Any new, any new business? Ms. Plant. Thinking a lot this year. Um, so anyway, um, there's a program that's going on. It goes on in um, at least one of our elementary schools, Code Connect. That's an after-school program that takes place. And um, I was speaking to, to the, the organizer of this, and he had mentioned he wanted to expand and um, was hoping to kind of gain interest in more of our schools so he could run this program. It's a program that teaches our students about coding. Um, I was wondering if we could invite him, perhaps, to come to one of our upcoming meetings so he can kind of speak on what the program is, and I'm hoping it would spark some interest so that um, other schools may, may want to get involved because yeah. he's Is this at the expand. Angelo? Or I'm not I sure. believe it happens at the Angelo. Or even perhaps, I know that he's done it at some schools, not regularly, so I don't know if it's maybe just happened at that school one time. Um, it I may see be Principal Pohl telling me it must have been at the George. Uh, I think he has done events there as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Very good. And the students love it. If you can just get some information to me, we'll certainly invite the group or the organizer um, to. Um, do, are you talking a school committee meeting? Are you talking. I thought perhaps we could have a presentation on it at one of our upcoming meetings. Mm -hmm. If that's can, something Can you just get that information to me? Absolutely. Oh, thanks. Okay, um, anyone see the need for an executive session? No? Okay, uh, any other announcements of any kind? All right, well, thank you for attending. How about um, someone making a motion to adjourn? All in favor? Thank you all. We are adjourned.